Um, as Anna has said, um, I am the chairperson of our research ethics committee at the faculty, and that is actually why I'm doing this. Um, it's also one of become one of my um, interests uh, that I really want to work on all the time in the last two or three years. So whenever I have time, I do try and um, read up on it and, um, you know, work out my presentations and do it a little bit more broadly. So I know there are some of the participants um, in our current masterclass who um, were participating last year as well. So you will here and there see there is a little bit of repetition, but hopefully you either forgot it or you will re um, appreciate a refresher. But I did try to work in some new content so that you are not completely um, bored by this morning's presentation. And recently I became a member of our Animal Ethics Committee uh, at UP because they need actually members from the humanities as well to be able to comply with our government's regulation on how an Animal Ethics Committee should be constituted. So that's also added a very interesting layer to um, my working with research ethics. So I'm privileged to be here. And I've got quite a bit of slides. I don't want to talk too fast. And I also don't want to um, give too much information. So here and there, I might just list some of the aspects. In some regards, I might go into a little bit more detail. And then so that I finish well ahead of time, because the session is an hour and a half, I really don't want to speak for an hour and a half. I don't think my voice will be able to do that. And it will be unfair towards the participants as well. So that, sorry, you can engage in some questions because there might be some ethical conundrums along the line. Now, unfortunately, I can't see the chat function, which is actually a little bit good for me so that my attention doesn't get diverted to what's happening in the chat function, because when I teach now um, via these online uh, platforms, I see comments from students and that sometimes stops me in mid-sentence, especially if it's something um, really off track. Um, so I can't see those. So, I mean, if you want to talk in the chat box, I suppose um, uh, um, that's okay. I won't be able to respond to that immediately and we can do that as we progress. So uh, when I start sharing now the rest of the presentation, there will be some moments where I will stop and just ask for some reflection. And for that specific moment, I think I will stop the screen sharing so that I can see your faces. So welcome to today's session and uh, let, let's continue. Let me see if I can just go and move over my slides. Oh, there we go. So outline of our seminar today is I will first look a little bit about ethics and decision making. Of course, this is not to reinvent the wheel. I won't be teaching you ethics, of course, just how in terms it relates. There's another plan coming by, of course, how it relates to where ethics and research intersect. So that's I will be looking briefly and how different approaches to ethics could influence um, the way we um, approach our research. Then um, we will be looking at why research ethics, history uh, uh, that necessitated the whole development of research ethics, briefly ethical principles and research, the Belmont report, the scope of re research ethics, sorry, what makes research ethical, power relations, the case for informed consent. And then I end off with an um, example that I recently discovered in one of my um, research sessions when I was doing research about research ethics and it's uh, I think for me it's I would like to present it as a type of a case study but it's more of a narrative of someone that became aware of their own positionality while they were doing research and the impact it had on their research ethics. Um, I do have the chapter available I downloaded it yesterday again so I will send that through to you if you are interested about that. It's titled on having imperial eyes. So that is the outline of a seminar and then um, you know what's coming. So let's look at this picture for a moment. Maybe some of you are familiar with the trolley problem, maybe some of you are not. So consider that and see what's happening there. Would you push the man off the bridge? With the um, um, thought that, or the outcome, that the man will stop the moving trolley, saving those lives. Um, I'm going to stop my screen sharing just for a moment because I want to see your faces and uh, see your comments um, on that. So let's just briefly hear um, in the chat box or whatever, what would you do? 
this is not uh, should shouldn't be too complicated answer it's about also your ethical instincts so let's hear what you would do you can put up your hands if you want to otherwise you can just type a quick yes or no in the chat box uh young philip please uh, my ethical instinct would tell me that uh, human life doesn't have um, um, a value that you can measure against other um, um, values of, of human lives and that's why I could not uh, I, I would not be able to sacrifice the, the one person with uh, its own uh, value of uh, human value um, for saving the others. Thank you so much for that. Cheryl? And then Catherine? Yeah. So, so I also agree with, with that. When it comes to utilitarianism, I like it not to actually do anything because I don't want any action coming back to me. I would rather let something happen as it happens. So in a, in a way, imagining myself as if I was not there rather than implying my own actions onto a situation uh, I hope my comment isn't coming back to bite me later in the year, <laughs> Dr. Von Weyck. <laughs> but this is just a personal, my personal way of thinking about it. Uh, thank you so much. Don't stress. This is not about um, coming back or anything. I'm trying to make a, a point in terms of some of the statistics that comes from this uh, trolley problem analysis, which I'm going to share with you now. So, uh, Catherine, please, what would you do? Yes or no? Would you push the man or not? Uh, I, I uh, according to my feeling, human beings are uh, very important, and therefore you cannot, uh, you cannot. Uh, uh, I for I personally, I can do nothing. Just like what Chela said, I just have to leave things happen because human beings are very important. You cannot sacrifice one person uh, because of the many. Okay, thank you so much for that. I'm going to stop for now because, I mean, only on this section. Oh, Solili is there. Solili, I'll give you a chance, a last one, and then I'm going to continue with the rest of the lecture because otherwise I know we can get stuck on this for two hours. Please, you're welcome. Um, uh, thanks so much, Doc. I, I think for me, I, I don't know whether there is another op uh, option uh, or that is of, for example, throwing myself onto the onto the trolley. Because as a, as a father in my home, that happens. I'm sure guys will will attest to that. If a robber comes in with a gun, we don't say children and and wife go sort him out. We throw without even thinking. And normally, you know, some people die in the process. So the art of throwing yourself in to save other lives, I think, happens almost automatically. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Trolile. Please, uh, the others who have other comments, keep that for now. It's very interesting what you did. Now I'm just going to continue sharing my screen now again. Um, it's that one there, and there we go. Okay, so hopefully you can see that all again. Um, so if we look at what you said, so just by a brief uh, look um, at what some of your comments, the overarching, um, uh, the overarching response from you was you wouldn't. What was clear from your response is that your context does play into it. For example, what Rolile has said now in terms of um, being faced with certain reality in a certain country or a certain village or town. I mean, that, of course, has got an influence. And this is why I decided to do this today, to show you, number one, that your context has an influence on the way you make ethical decisions. And therefore, the way you answer if something is ethical or not might change over time and will absolutely depend on where you are, your geographical location. And we're going to get back to that in a few slides. But what's interesting is, of course, that our ethics decisions or our ethical decisions are never devoid of our interests. So from a utilitarian perspective, yes, which is utilitarian, which Charles referred to, is um, the decision that leads to the well-being of the greatest number of people would in theory say, if it is about the well-being of the greatest amount of people, we will probably push him off the bridge to stop the trolley, saving one, uh, sacrificing one to save five. The interesting thing that your, um, your responses has indicated that it is quite on par for how the majority of people re react. 
Um, statistically, the majority of people when faced with this um, issue does not follow the utilitarian um, perspective. Um, only about 10% of people usually asked will say, yes, it's okay. Statistically, other statistics is important as well when it comes to this example. More men than women would push the man from the bridge. More people would push the man from the bridge after watching a funny movie. And more people would push a man than a woman from the bridge, statistically. Now, if you want to go check me up on these statistics, you are welcome to Google the trolley problem. And it was designed by Philippa Foote in 1967. And there was, of course, as Paulie has said, there is another option. One of the other um, um, examples or changes in this trolley uh, example was uh, there's not a man on a bridge, but there is a trolley and there is a train or a train or a trolley and there are two tracks. And on the one track, there are five people either tied down or busy working or children playing. Or on the other track, there's one person either working or tied down or doing whatever. And then the same issue applies. If you change lanes, do you choose the five or the one? Then it becomes um, uh, also a different type of, of ethical approach or different type of situation that you are faced with in terms of, because then you've got like the fork in the road right in front of you as well. Although some of the principles might be the same. So there, is, there, there are other renditions of the trolley problem as well. What am I trying to say to you when I show the statistics? Of course, from a research ethics perspective and from a hermeneutics of suspicion, you are quite probably wanting to question some of these statistics. Um, in other words, how do we interpret these statistics? Um, are these statistics based on uh, some presumptions around gender? Are these statistics based on some assumptions surrounding uh, gender stereotyping, for example? Um, and that would be uh, an interesting conversation. Like I said, if you, if you more or less uh, do some research on the trolley problem, you get different renditions of it, but the broad uh, framework or the broad outcome of the statistics all point to um, these type of broad aspects. It would be interesting to see if this changes over time. So what's the point I'm trying to make? Number one, your approach influences um, the outcome, okay? And it's the same for research ethics as well. Number two, one can never generalize in terms of what you think people would do. And um, it's something that you need to take in account, into account when you do your own research design, because research ethics is important when you do your research design. And of course, being aware of interests and possible stereotyping surrounding the information or the data you might um, uh, um, compile, but going back a step, step even further in terms of with what approach and what perspective do you actually approach your research. And today, at the end of today's lecture, I'm going to end off with an example, like a narrative that I got from one of um, the uh, works that I was busy studying. And it's a woman doing research on Indigenous people in Australia and her narrative about what she realised from her own positionality and how it impacted her research ethics in terms of a research design, etc. So this sort of links up with at the end what we are going to do. And I just wanted to start that off with us. So let's continue um, with the rest of our lecture. So broadly, before we get into where ethics and um, research intersect, of course, um, ethics is the reflection on the foundations very important when we start talking about different foundations, different epistemologies, etc. Ethics is a reflection on the foundations, the approaches and the frameworks that we use to make decisions about morality, what is wrong and right and good and bad. And this does not change when it comes to research ethics. These, uh, these decisions that we make about what is wrong and right, good and bad, cannot separate it from the way we approach any type of research that we do. And this is not only about in doing empirical research. Um, it's very interesting that research ethics does actually not only zoom in, it, it places a lot of emphasis on empirical research, that is research with where humans as participants are involved, and um, as course uh, in many definitions, um, a, a research conducted with animals. But if the research ethics is also about your own um, being able to give an account, to put it a short, the most short, shortest way, sorry, being able to give an account of your own positionality, your own position, where you come from, your frame of reference, that is an ethical issue. 
Um, it's an, and and uh, the more we start to consider different knowledges, different epistemologies, I think the more this issue will become important. So the three aspects of morality, I was just doing this with some of my students a week or two ago, is what is a good or a just society? So you start basically there. If your vision for a, <clears throat> sorry, a good or a just society is, for example, a society in which human dignity is important, it means you will be able to determine, based on that vision for a good society, what you think a good or virtuous person is. And you will be, you will, uh, according to that, um, make up a framework in terms of what you think a good decision is. Because your decision will, the, the type of decision that you make influences the type of person you are and the type of person influences the way you can realize what your vision is of, for a good or a just society. And in your estimation, what you would think other people contributes to the um, to, to realizing what your vision or their vision is of a good or just society. So those three aspects of morality are actually three levels and they implicate one another um, in terms of that it's almost like a domino effect. The one leads to the other. And in this um, context, uh, sorry, in this regard, context, epistemology and hermeneutics are extremely important. The way you understand knowledge, the way you understand reality um, and uh, the context that you come from. So there are various approaches and unfortunately I don't have time to do that with you today but at the end of today's presentation I've got a whole list of references that you will be able to use and one of those for example um, takes these different approaches in ethics and connect them directly to how one um, does your research design and uh, if you follow a certain approach of course you will get to a certain outcome and following this, uh, um, this approach directly influences the type of outcome that you will have. Now broadly various approaches in ethics and there are different subdivisions in this and you will find this maybe in different works, uh, different structures, but broadly, various approaches in ethics are, for example, the ontology, which is about what is your duty and following the rule and the law. So that is a little bit more clear cut in some regards. The other way, and this is something we looked at this morning briefly, is consequentialism, which utilitarianism is a form of that. What is the outcome or the consequence or the benefit? Liberal individualism is based on the... Um, conviction that human rights are the basis of all ethical issues and here you can start to see how your vision for a good society would influence how you, on which grounds you would determine who is a virtuous person and on which grounds you would de determine if a decision is good or not good. Communitarianism, what is important for society as a whole and virtue ethics, which is being very much emphasized um, these days, is that someone's character is important for ethical decision making. And the classic virtues there are wisdom, courage, justice, and moderation. Now, this comes into play when one does one's research design and you start to think about your approach in terms of um, how, how do you approach something like empirical research? How do you approach people who are involved in that? How do you approach the knowledge that is involved in that? How do you approach the knowledge that is being compiled in terms of research? How do you go about that knowledge? How do you use it in an ethical way? All of that um, will lead uh, and be very connected to your approach. And within um, re ethics in general, but in research uh, ethics specifically, there are different kinds of values involved. And the one is shared values, namely what is agreed upon. And then there are divergent values. Where do we not agree? And shared values is, for example, uh, we can say that um, we share a legal code or a framework, or we can maybe say, yes, we agree that there's something like a good strawberry and it tastes nice. Divergent values might be um, aesthetic values, religious value and end of life values, for example. So your approach and your understanding of value and the values you share and the values you don't share all have an influence when it comes to your research design and uh, incorporating your, um, uh, no, it's the other way around, in terms of um, seriously considering your ethical approach when you do your research design. So let's just find the next slide. So here we start to get a little bit more into detail in terms of research ethics. So why something like this? Why are we even 
bothered with this. And I was just speaking to a colleague of mine. It's not inconceivable that students in future should consider as part of their methodology section, even though they are doing a literature study, that they uh, um, explain their own ethical um, departure point when it comes to doing research in general. Um, so it's not inconceivable that that um, would become part of doing your methodology in future. If, it's, if you're doing empirical research, I think it's already part of that. But um, the point is, it's becoming extremely important for the fact that a history that goes back quite a bit of time and keeps on sort of building upon each other. So two main things in history um, that we know of, I'm sure there are many others as well, but these are the ones that sort of were benchmarks in a bad way for leading to the whole uh, notion and conceptualization of something like research ethics. And the first one was cruel and lethal medical research projects that were carried out in, during the Second World War. And that led to the Nuremberg Code, which I've got on a separate screen for you now. And it also led to the Helsinki Declaration, namely ethics principles for research involving human subjects. But there was also the Tuskegee syphilis study and in which 600 poor African-American men were recruited into the project to establish the natural history of syphilis. But they were not aware that they were in the research study. And after the discovery of penicillin in 1945, the treatment um, was deliberately withheld from participants to study the natural history of the disease. That led to the Belmont Report. So the Nuremberg Code, the Helsinki Declaration and the Belmont Report, those three things together has brought us where we are today. However, um, it is important to note from the start that there are some, I think, uh, contextual emphases that have developed along um, the line, along the way in terms of different contexts as well which uh, means that some of these specific principles that developed in a very specific um, context were adapted to other contexts as well. And some of these contexts came forth and said, but there are other things that we also need to consider. So the Nuremberg Code said 10 basic things. Voluntary human consent is essential. Experimental results should result in the good for society. Anticipated results should justify the experiment avoid all unnecessary physical and mental suffering, no experiment if there is a chance of death or disability, minimize the risk of subjects, proper preparations and facilities to protect subjects, experiments conducted only by qualified persons, subjects can withdraw at any time, and terminate experiments if results are known or with best judgment. Now you can hear this is very much linked to a uh, sort of a medical uh, type of uh, research situation, although some of those principles are carried on and developed further in something like the Belmont Report, which is more about broad ethical principles that's not only connected to specific um, medical or experimental type of situations. The Belmont Report states four um, broad ethical principles. The first one, and this is a general and later on in, in the lecture this morning, I will look at different contexts in terms of this and how some of these aspects have been interpreted in that context. So the first one is respect for persons. So, I mean, that's the uh, ethical principle that is the overarching one and the one that has received the most emphasis as well. And this is really about um, how people that are capable of deliberation about their choices should be treated with respect and permitted to exercise self-determination. Now, this is very important because this was the forerunner of what we have today in terms of informed consent. And I'm going to get to that um, close to the end of the lecture. Informed consent is something that is general into countries all over the world. It's not only something particular to our country. It's actually part of a, a UN charter, but I'll get to that later on. Respect for persons and autonomy, I think, in different contexts would, of course, include a respect for different types of knowledges and epistemology as well. Very important. Persons who lack capacity or have diminished capacity for deliberation about the choices must be protected against harm from irresponsible choices. And then uh, respect for persons recognize that dignity, well-being and safety uh, interests of all the research participants are the primary concern. Um, what does autonomy include? The ability to deliberate about the decision, interests of the participants should always outweigh the interests of science and society. 
involvement of persons in the research should be justified. And this underpins the concept of informed consent and confidentiality, which we will have a brief look at a little bit later. So overarching, this is why this one is mentioned first, respect for persons and autonomy. The other three principles that are sort of governing research ethics or governing is the incorrect word, um, sort of structures and provides like an overarching framework for a research ethics in different contexts is um, non-maleficence, beneficence and justice and equality. And this is related to the principle of not doing harm, doing good, balancing benefits against danger and the cost. And the last one, I want to stand still for just a moment again, in terms of justice and equality, which is one of the ethical principles of the Belmont Report. And this is about distributive justice and fairness in terms of the risk benefit ba uh, um, uh, balance, but also again, it, it links up with the autonomy of the person and the person to be able to make their own decisions, to be able to interpret the reality according to um, their knowledge systems, for example. The principle of equality is that no segment of the population should be unduly burdened by the harms of research or denied the benefits of knowledge derived from it. And there should be a reasonable likelihood that the population from which the participants come will benefit, if not immediately, then in future. So it's really about guarding against any form of coercion and exploitation and abuse. So to recap, the four ethical principles that humanity came up with as a broad framework for doing research that is ethical is the respect for persons and autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence and justice and equality. Those are the overarching principles and wherever you read anything or encounter anything in terms of research ethics, those four principles are there and it might just be adapted in terms of focusing on specific case study, but the bottom line, the structure, the foundation of doing research that is ethical always comes back to these four. And as I continue and I start to talk about but what makes research ethical, uh, what is something like informed consent, why is it necessary, everything is linked up to these broad ethical principles. So what is the scope of research ethics? It's where ethics and research intersect and therefore the scope of research ethics um, extends to all the approaches in ethics generally, that's why I started about talking about the different approaches. So if you want to talk about what research ethics is, it's important that you would be able to um, give an account of your own approach, okay, to justify your approach, to be able to prove that the research necessitates this approach, for example. Um, the scope of research ethics is also about all decisions that are made in research. The moment you make a decision to do this or not this, uh, follow this approach, not the other one. Um, use this type of literature or not the other one. The way you reference it, the way you talk to people, the way you design your, your interviews, your research design, all of those things. Every single type of decision um, is an ethical decision in the end and in the beginning as well, actually. And therefore, it's all decisions that are made in research. It's the values and the interest involved in research. And this is particularly important when it comes to setting up any type of um, empirical research uh, situation. And of course, about interpreting the data as well, uh, because we are not blank slates and uh, we are preconditioned with a lot of things determined uh, by our context and our history, our uh, um, societal setting and positions. And um, therefore our values and interests are always involved in this. And the consideration of these aspects as they relate to all of the role plays, it's not some of the role plays, all of the role plays and stakeholders involved in the research. And the narrative that I have at the end of our lecture today, hopefully will prove how this researcher came to realize that uh, the code of conduct that you, for example, set up wasn't um, ethically sound because it only referred to um, how she thought she would conduct. She didn't take into account in terms of her, her relationship and her um, engagement with the society that she was working in. So it's really about the consideration of all the aspects as they relate to all the role plays and all the stakeholders that are involved. What makes research ethical? 
Your answer might vary through time and in different situations, as we uh, try to point out with the trolley um, case. And your answer might vary according to your geographic location. This is one of the two points that the um, uh, teacher I had a few years ago when I started with research ethics and I started to go for courses. This is one of the first things that he said. But what makes research with people and animals legal? So the first one is what makes research ethical? This might differ. But what makes research with people and animals legal is based with compliance with law. Now the question is, can research which is ethical be legal, illegal or vice versa? Can research which is ethical be illegal or vice versa? I'm just going to stop there for a moment and just quickly get two or three remarks. Can research which is ethical be illegal or vice versa? Just give me a quick response or a quick example. Take about two minutes or so. If it's a heavy question, then um, I recognize that. I might come back to it a little bit later as well. So can research that is ethical be illegal? And can research that is legal be unethical? I can think immediately of two examples, but um, I would like to hear some from you. Or yes or no, what do you think? Don't stress people, it's just, I just don't want to carry on without getting your input on this. I think the answer, is, the answer is yes. Okay, do you have an example? Uh, I can think of some, it. but let's... Into detail, yeah. so. uh, no, not now, let's keep it, but I think yes. Okay, great. Cheryl, quickly. Uh, I... I would venture a example, maybe something like animal testing, certain animal testing, which is considered legal, but it's, it's horrible. And I think some people are opening their eyes to it and it's stopping now, but that would be my example, Great. maybe. Great, thanks. I'm going to continue sharing now. I just wanted to do a brief um, stop there. So indeed, if I just go on there, Euthanasia is an example of um, where the ethical eth ethicality, I only learned this word the other day, and the legality might not be, uh, might be contradicting one another. And of course, as was just mentioned, animal testing as well. Um, there are a lot of strong opinions with regard to euthanasia. And as I started working on the Animal Ethics Committee, um, there were times that I really wanted to sort of interrupt the whole ethical process um, for me because it's, it's considered very much legal and I actually asked for literature on the subject um, and um, it's basically based on a utilitarian view um, and a utilitarian approach which we showed earlier is not without its problems. Hey? So the question that my teacher in this regard was pointed out to me when I started studying this is the question in the end is we can do it, but should we? And I mean, I, th I think that is basically a very important undergirding principle when it comes to ethics in general, but also to research ethics. We can do it, but should we? Therefore, what makes ethical, what makes research ethical, and this links up to, I think, the four ethical principles we mentioned in terms of the Belmont report. Um, there must be a social and scientific value and validity, fair participant selections, favorable risk benefit ratio, independent review, informed consent, respect for participants and collabor sorry, collaborative partnership. Those are some of the things that are considered um, that makes research ethical. But of course, this is not the only things that um, are needed to be considered. Those are some of the sometimes the more obvious ones that jumps out. But there are, of course, a other host of issues that are involved as well. Number one, the vulnerability of the participants. And there's a whole definition regarding vulnerability and who is regarded as vulnerable groups. Last night, when I had a look on the European Commission's um, guidelines for applying for funding, um, one of the um, uh, one of the groups that are designated as vulnerable are people in uh, developing countries, which I suppose um, is uh, open for discussion in terms of the way that we've discussed development over the uh, past few um, years and also in this course as well. But that, for example, is listed. But the, the common um, 
examples of the vulnerability and who is defined as vulnerable are, of course, marginalized groups, um, economically marginalized people as well, women, children, um, etc. The qualifications of persons conducting research is also something that needs serious consideration. Stigmatization and stereotyping is something that slips in so quickly. And therefore, part of research ethics is this uh, notion of participatory sort of review and a review process so that someone can help you realize if you are stigmatizing and stereotyping. Um, someone that can help you look from a hermeneutics of suspicion, for example, to see that this is taking place. And we have had a lot of examples in our country uh, the past two or three years of research that was um, approved but uh, really came down to a severe stigmatization and stereotyping, especially when it comes to doing research in communities that are, for example, what they call cross-cultural research. And uh, for example, doing research with, with people, groups that is not the same gender as you, same sexuality as you, same ethnicity. Um, in one of the references that I will add in the end of the lecture, there's a whole outline of um, things to be aware of when this type of um, cross what would one say, um, cross paradigm um, uh, research is conducted to be aware of this. Also the resources that are available should always be considered. Power relations of the researcher and the participants are extremely important. It's so important that I'm gonna spend a slide on that after this. And then of course connects it to all of this is recognizing the variety of epistemologies, knowledges and ways of knowing. These are things that also need to be considered once one thinks about uh, if the research is ethical or not. Power relations, as because I'm a feminist scholar, um, feminist theologian, of course, um, when it comes to power relations, um, all my antennas are always um, very high and my eyes are very open. I'm very attuned to any type of, um, you know, um, my mind is only working in Afrikaans this morning, but any type of there we go imbalance in power relations. So of course, power relations are, sorry, applicable to all role players and stakeholders. So this is about your interview settings, your interview questions, refraining from unfair discrimination, refraining from sexual harassment. Um, and this is particularly important on that our university that was recently finished up the whole anti-discrimination policy and sexual harassment, for example, um, unfortunately uh, happens really quickly and uh, perpetrates is usually always, we didn't know, we, d we weren't aware, which of course in, in unfortunately a lot of cases um, is to be questioned if, if they were or not, because these things happen um, very, um, very, very quickly. And um, therefore, when it comes to research ethics, these are really aspects when it comes to power and recognizing this um, power relationships that really need to be, um, you need to be super aware of this. Refraining from abusing supervisory authority, which unfortunately does occur much more than one thinks. Beware of coercion, conflict of interest must be declared and know and respect the context. Now on Monday's lecture, in the gender justice lectures, I am going to spend a little bit of time again on, on power. And those of you that attended last year would know, I like to use the example of the power suitcase. Now, um, although I will be reworking the lecture content, um, I'm going to spend some time on the power suitcase again and in whose hands it is. It's a very powerful metaphor to be able to understand how this works because the people that have got the power most of the time would not be aware that they have um, and um, or they would specifically be aware of it and abuse it. But some of the times they won't even realize that they are coming with a certain perspective to a situation and not being aware of their own positionality as the narrative would point out at the end of today's lecture. So people, if you think um, this lecture is dragging on quite a bit, don't stress, we are uh, entering the last um, section of the lecture today. So I thought I'd make, because um, in South Africa, we've got a lot of legislation that um, governs research ethics and research ethics committee. And, and that's not applicable to everyone in, in all different countries all over the world. But what is important for every single person doing any type of research Especially uh, specifically uh, empirical research is the case for informed consent. And that is definitely not only the case for South Africa. 
it's really a general principle. And this goes back to the history of ethics, uh, uh, research ethics, and of course, the Belmont reports as well. Any person making a decision to participate as a research participant in a research study has the right to inform consent. One of the most pivotal principles in research ethics in many international conventions and guidelines, and this is informed consent, that it's explicitly mentioned as a principle in Article 7 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is a United Nations Treaty. Now, the constitution of our country, which governs a lot of my work in, in my committee and the University um, Senate Research Ethics Committee, um, states that everyone has the right to bodily and psychological integrity, which includes the right not to be subjected to medical or scientific experiments without the informed consent. Therefore, studies conducted without informed consent of participants or persons acting on their behalf are unconstitutional and unethical. And people, there are rather large studies out there talking exactly about how to design informed consent, what format it should take, what aspects should be involved. In the slide after this, I've got a brief overview of those things. In South Africa, our National Health Act includes research that contributes to knowledge about psychological and social processes in human beings. Therefore, um, any person doing studies from a, a humanities perspective and religious theology, the moment you do empirical research, you have to apply for ethical clearance because of that specific um, sentence in the National Health Act. Uh, of South Africa. In the European Commission, like I said, ethics for researchers, the ethics review procedure of 2013, there might be a newer version, but I found a quite large section on informed consent as well. And informed consent is meant to guarantee the voluntary participation in research and is probably the most important procedure to address privacy issues and research. Um, this is really universal and it's really important that people be aware that they, and this goes back to the respect and the autonomy of persons, the ethical principles, but also specifically the, the justice and the equality um, in terms of uh, uh, um, the ethical principles for doing research. I cannot um, emphasize this enough because the way you do this and the way you approach people says something about the way that you respect and recognize dignity um, and their situatedness and your own positionality. So informed consent is the thing that is should probably get the most um, attention when done, one does empirical research in uh, research ethics. That, that section really should. And it's, for example, the thing that is in our country at least um, scrutinized the most by research ethics committees. So to continue that specific <clears throat> section, Informed consent then consists of three components, adequate information, no deception, voluntariness and competence. And the information must be given a simple and clear style by the use of a home language, mother tongue. This is done to ensure that the participants understand so are able to ask questions. People, I, because I work a lot with this, I do see that people underestimate um, their own positionality when it comes to setting up the research design. And they um, uh, um, underestimate their own positionality when it comes to setting up uh, interview um, uh, settings and questions. And therefore, um, if one takes the two principles of respect for people and autonomy and the justice and equality as your core uh, uh, aspects, uh, principles in this regard, this, this aspect of, of, of meeting someone in a style that will work for them and where they are able to participate as free autonomous uh, persons are extremely important. Um, informed consent may be both written and verbal. And now today, this is of course very interesting for us because a lot of us want to do research projects which are not able to give people like forms to sign. So we have to um, look at our frames of reference in terms of and the scope of, of our, our research activities and design ways to get this consent from people, which means they won't be because they won't always be able to physically sign something due to the pandemic that we are currently in. Anonym, anonymity. My, my, my tongue can never say that word, so I uh, apologize in advance for that. Participants will remain anonymous and unidentified throughout the study. 
in South Africa, we've also got a lot of new legislation on the 1st of July that's kicking in, um, but I'm not going to talk about that now. Confidentiality, participants are assured that identifying information will not be made available to anyone who is not directly involved in the study. And of course, they're able to withdraw without any consequences. That is broadly the case for informed consent. So summary checklist. And this has been adapted from uh, the work by Gary Comstock on, respons on responsible conduct of research. Number one, he's got this four broad outlines, which I've adapted a little bit. Protecting what he says in, uh, in the quotation marks, my interests, is about reporting misconduct, avoiding plagiarism, and justifying your decisions. Promotes our interests. That's thinking about codes of conduct for all the party stakeholders involved. Write cooperatively, protect your manuscripts, and clarify your statistics. Number three, respect each other's, respect others' rights. This is about the informed consent, mentor inclus inclusively, recognize property and reveal conflicts. And finally, overarching to all of those things is honor all interests, treat humanely, preserve environments and cultivate responsibility. I thought this is a helpful sort of broad checklist when one thinks about doing a research design, but as I end off today's lecture with the narrative that I'm going to read some aspects um, from, I think the moment we have a checklist, checklist like this, it's important to immediately say that it's not cast in stone. I mean, I adapted some of his headings as well. Um, and to be able to recognize that in your context, um, this broad checklist might look a little bit different. So I get to the end of our lecture today because I want to leave at least in half an hour for discussion. Libby Porter, chapter, her chapter in the uh, work on uh, ethics in planning research is about uh, her recognition about the positionality and power. And this is just an example to say how important research ethics is. Um, her, the title of her contribution in that work, and that work, by the way, I find very interesting because there's a lot of narratives reflection um, in that work from different contexts on, on ethics and research and planning research. Her contribution is on having imperial eyes, and it's about the positionality and power of the research in cross-cultural research settings, and in particular post-colonial settings where indigenous people are the objects of a wide social sciences research interest. And I read from her own narrative in the beginning of that chapter. She said, in deciding to pursue a PhD research project that investigated the highly contested relationship between indigenous people and environmental planners in Victoria, Australia, I had underpinned my whole research approach with a very seductive myth. It went like this. I am going to do research with not on indigenous peoples. I will be ethically sensitive and culturally aware. I will make a significant contribution to the people who are involved. And I will certainly not pursue research patterns of the not too distant past when knowledge and artifacts were routinely stolen from indigenous people in the name of scientific interest and the personal gains of academic researchers. No, I will be quite different from that kind of researcher. Myths repeated, she says, becomes pretty convincing, and it took me, her, a long time to see that I, too, have imperial eyes, she says in the beginning of that um, uh, section of her chapter. She goes on to describe what happened, and she says the following. Mike, she went to her, before I read that, she actually went to her supervisors and tried to set up a code of conduct because setting up a code of conduct in terms of your research design is general practice. But she realized that her code of conduct was very one-sided and it was uh, influenced by this myth that she said to herself, she will be different because she is aware. She came to the conclusion that even though she thought she was aware of these things, she wasn't aware enough about it. So... My code of conduct was deeply circumscribed by the Western culture that was its authority. Look at how she spells that author and authority. While intellectual property was addressed, it was attributed to the provider of that information in an individual sense. Participant X said this, participant Y said that. 
individualized notions of knowledge and property were intrinsically instilled into the ethical framework. Given its attention to procedural problem, my code failed to address or acknowledge those much deeper ethical quandaries that were always present in the research and which I alluded to earlier. This is perhaps best explicated in the notion that the code only governed the research practice and not its design. This is where my myth really began to unravel, she says. After an extended period of time in the field and lots of discussions with supervisors and lots of reflective writing, I began to admit to the really rather obvious fact that this was my research, my design, my worldview. It wasn't the slightest bit collaborative or participatory or grassroots. Research subjects were not involved in the design of research questions or the methodological approach. It was instigated, designed and implemented and analyzed entirely by me. As a result, my research design was like all other research designs, structured by the researcher's epistemological and ontological position. This is the final part of the narrative. For those like me with imperial eyes, we assume that the world is open to us as knowing subjects, that we can make the world knowable to us through our own empirical endeavors. Learning is our privilege, knowledge of the world virtually a right. Research in settings and situations where post-colonial politics will structure the relationship between researcher and research must be present to this dilemma and undertake to properly conceptualize what it means for the research. That it is possible to be in the us position observing them in that position over there. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, must be recognized as a construct of historically constituted social relations. The naturalness with which researchers with imperial eyes assume that position must continuously be the subject of analysis. In that sense, we unlearn following Spivak and the, the other uh, unknown Spivak's work. That's why I mentioned him specifically. The right to our own knowledge and newly learn the fact and the implications of our own positionality. We expose our deployment of an invisible standpoint from which we construct our knowledge of the world. I really want to emphasize that last sentence. We expose our deployment of an invisible standpoint from which we construct our knowledge of the world. We all have got knowledge of the world. It's always sometimes for us invisible. We sometimes assume it when it comes to research ethics, putting aside all the legal things that needs to be done in certain contexts and the things we need to ascribe with, we sometimes always get to that point and make sure we tick all those boxes, but we also actually need to take a few steps back and look at our research design and look at our own positionality. And that's why I'm saying it might become commonplace um, for students, even doing literature, anal literature analysis and literature studies, to be able to describe their own positionality and the understanding of knowledge. I know a lot of people do it already, but I think this might become commonplace practice in future to be able to acknowledge different contexts in this regard. So I would like to thank you for um, allowing me this almost just under an hour. And there are some references. Now, the ones I use today, for example, are um, I actually used all of those for today. But the ones that I um, use the most are the ones at the bottom. So there's a lot more probably available than I've listed here. Ethics and Planning Research, The Student's Guide to Research Ethics, uh, A Philosophical Guide to Responsible Conduct of Research, Morality is a Way of Life, um, which is a wonderful little book by um, Ernst Conradi. It's very thin, but it's extremely uh, helpful. It really um, sets out the basic issues involved. What is a good life? And I prefer to use then South African authors in this regard for the South African context as well. It really helps. Um, the Sarima Research Ethics and Fundamentals course, they do a course every year. I'm going to try and enroll myself for this year's course again. And then, of course, that's my very first course that I did with Verdi van Staden from the Center for Ethics and Philosophy. And then, of course, I present annual research courses at our faculty as well. And some of the information that come from my own presentations and from others, and I continuously uh, adapt these. So I want to thank you. And that is me for now. I'm going to stop sharing.
And now I'm open to some comments, some remarks. I know it's a lot of information. Maybe there are some things that I did not cover, then I apologize in advance for that. Uh, but it's really a large field. And I tried specifically not to focus too much on the South African situation and look in principles broadly. So thank you so much, um, Anna, I'll give over to you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I learned a lot. Um, so if you want to ask Tanya a question, please raise your hand via Zoom. I mean the Zoom hand. And if you are not able to unmute yourself because your internet connection is so bad, you can write your question in the chat. I will monitor that, but it would be nicer for everyone, I think, if you try to speak up. Yes, Xolile. Uh, th thank you very much, um, Doc. Uh, I want to ask this question, but to be to try and make it as practical as possible. So it's not just theoretical. Um, I'm making reference here to the need, uh, for example, uh, one of the aspects that you you dealt with here is. Uh, informed consent. Normally, we ensure that that is the case. Uh, you know, people for fear of reprisal and those kind of things, not only just for injury to themselves, but that if they get involved and then um, they might have those kind of fears. Uh, but I want us to balance that also with the need for the community to know. Normally, the journalistic, uh, when they pursue uh, knowledge, they'll then say it's investigative because we want people to know. Now, to make it practical relating to my study, uh, I'm dealing with the area of corruption. And I've identified two municipalities. And, and so there already you come up against a challenge where people already are kind of apprehensive in terms of that. And you guarantee them that anonymity, you know, no one will know and all of that. But if anyone really wants to know, <laughs> you can always drill down to where that information came from. And, and that's still to have people actually, in a sense, uh, being viewed in a particular light. And so how, how do we then, uh, how are we then guided through research ethics, where on one hand, you being a South African, uh, you want to know where uh, corruption exists. But on the other, us people who want to pursue these things uh, through informed consent and all the other measures that protect that seem to say it is not okay uh, to delve into that. Uh, how, 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 do, how does one like myself approach something like that um, in light of what we've just dealt with? Uh, thank you, thank you, Doc. Thank you, um, Kolile. That is a very important question, and it's one I get all the time, I must be honest, and it's one I'm always scared of a little bit, to be honest, because um, all the more students um, want to do studies on corruption for all obvious reasons. And it's always interesting because most institutions and most companies and main organizations have got what they call like a whistleblowing type of um, policy. And of course, being a policy, it usually almost always only protects, um, to put it bluntly, most of the time the perpetrators a lot because it's supposed to help you to be able to do this whistleblowing. Um, but sometimes it makes it so difficult to do it that you almost like all of uh, give up halfway because of the hierarchical structure of most institutions. Um, that's one issue. That's why I'm, I'm, I know that I get this question all the time. The thing is, when it comes to my field, which is specifically, uh, it's, it's research ethics, but I've, I work a lot with uh, research ethics in a theological and a religious context. I know a lot of people want to do corruption um, in terms of what's happening in religious communities, for example. And I always have to then think about if this is something that um, is done within the scope of the type of research that we are doing, because um, for example, when one does this research uh, in a master's or a PhD, or you want to do it, one must ask the question in terms of 
doing a master's degree or PhD is not to equate it with, for example, investigative journalism, for example, which many of the times people want to, uh, and, and as, like I said, I get this question all the time. Many times I see people want to enroll for a master's or a PhD because they actually want to do something that's equated with whistleblowing or exposing corruption. And then it's always getting back to the students asking, but what methods, what theories are underlying this? What type of analysis will you use? If you are studying something specifically um, in terms of a phenomenon, then there are theories and methods that will guide that. And then these four ethical principles will enter into it. But uh, many, many of the times I find that students want to just whistleblow. And then it's really difficult for me to try and get them back to, you know, designing something, a research um, that is about uh, contributing knowledge to a specific section and not only about doing whistleblowing. So when it comes to informed consent, of course, when it's um, you try to do something like uh, that, a student of mine a few years ago wanted to expose corruption in some of his leadership um, uh, structures in his specific uh, denomination. And he used, for example, um, uh, comments by people made during minutes of synod meetings. And we had to remove all of those things because um, you cannot use that type of information if it's not a matter of public record. So to answer your question, it's a long thing that Anna said. Um, I would be happy to engage with you a little bit more, but it's always for me difficult in terms of figuring out what the uh, um, purpose is behind the research and if it's you know, contributing to a certain uh, field of knowledge or if it's simply about um, exposing corruption, because that will, of course, influence your different methods that you would use. But I'm happy to engage with you. But of course, you are 100 percent correct. Informed consent is always about knowledge. It's about uh, being transparent and about being accountable. But this will be influenced by, um, you know, the, the overbroad or the overarching purpose of a research. Thank you so much for that question. I really appreciate it, although I always am afraid of getting it. But thanks for asking it. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Yes, Emmanuel, please. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, um, Emmanuel, it's uh, I thought of the Reform Canal is Isaac. It is raining cats and dogs here. It is raining cats and dogs here in Ghana. Emmanuel, we couldn't hear the start of what you were saying to the, due to the connection. Maybe you give it a try from the beginning. <laughs> All right. So what I'm saying is that it, it is raining cats and dogs here in Ghana. Please, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay. So after seeking the consent of someone, and the person says, I don't want to be recorded. I don't want to be recorded. What do you do? Because you need to record a person and transcribe the data. But the person says, I don't want to be recorded. I don't want my name to be mentioned in your thesis. What do you do? Thank you um, for that question. I think that's a little bit easier for me to answer. If someone does not want to be recorded and they don't want to be mentioned, that is sacrosanct. You must honor that. Um, then you have to come up with a different method of um, writing or making notes in that regard. But if someone does not want to record, you have got no right whatsoever um, uh, to record them. I actually um, found out a few years ago when we, sounds feel so long ago, but actually it's just uh, the year before last, when sometimes I was presenting lectures, students would uh, record me while I was doing the lecture or, um, uh, you know, talking and, and I didn't know. I realized that when I would walk past them and they've got their cell phones. And I can understand why students would want to record the lecture because it might help them afterwards, although they did not ask my consent. And in a country and in a 
frame of reference where we have things like social media um, scrutinizing everything, where we've got something like um, public shaming um, taking place all the time as well. Um, I personally refuse uh, to uh, be recorded if I was not asked beforehand. I don't mind being recorded, but I want to be able to give my consent. As a human being and as an autonomous person, being be able to make free choices, I want the right to know, number one, because this goes back to what Rolila has asked. I mean, if this is a whistleblowing or investigative journalism type of thing, um, there are absolutely going to be principles governing this. But if you are doing research, you need to ask them. That's the first thing. Uh, they really need to uh, consent to that. Um, it's, and if they don't want to, then that's it. You, you can't do it. And you find other ways to do that. But in all cases, you do respect that person. If they don't want to be mentioned, of course, that's even a more sacrosanct principle of research ethics. If they don't want to be mentioned, they don't want to be mentioned. Um, and you, you're not allowed to do that. In most cases, um, confidentiality and, and anonymity is, is sacrosanct. So thank you so much for that question. It's really highlighting the importance of that. Uh, Doc, please uh, ask a follow-up question. Uh, if the person doesn't want to be recorded, but you need names of people in your thesis, can you drop that participant and pick another person? Yeah, that's an interesting notion because usually people um, uh, have got the right to withdraw from your research. But Emmanuel, I must be honest, the general principle is not to use people's names. Um, there must be a specific research topic or theme that is, um, for example, one of our students recently did research on Adrian Flock, which is um, a very prominent person in the country in terms of his um, working uh, um, and, and all the legislation that he brought on in terms of um, apartheid legislation and the, the crimes committed. I mean, when you go talk about into Adrian Flock, then of course you will mention someone like Adrian Flock's name. That's a different push, 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 uh, issue. It's like, um, but if you are inviting participants and the nature of the study is sensitive, they, they don't have to. And I will be honest, you're going to then struggle to find people that will just openly um, pronounce themselves um, available to mention their names, because usually you are doing that research because you are gathering data in that regard. And there's a lot of legislation in different uh, countries um, regarding the protection of personal information in any case. So um, I suppose you would be able to drop them, but um, you would have to ask yourself how ethical is that in terms of your broader research design, I think. Thank you. So we have three questions and the order would be Jan Philipp, Catherine and then Deirdre. Yes, please, Jan Philipp. Yes, thank you a lot, Tanya, uh, for, for this amazing presentation full of information. I learned a lot. Um, I wanted to come back to the topic of informed consent. I find it very, very important for research ethics. And when I, if I understood well, there are two parts. We spoke now uh, a lot about the part of being informed. So you have to inform your participants uh, about what they are doing, what they are participating in and so on. But then there is another part, which is uh, voluntariness. And you, you also mentioned it. And I was wondering, for example, um, in our city in Berlin, we always see these publicities for um, medical surveys, medical research um, uh, things where you can apply to. And there is financial, um, how can I say, there's a financial issue with it. So they, they give you money for participating in it. And I was wondering whether you, what would you say about this? Uh, is it uh, still volu voluntary participation if someone gets uh, something like 4,000 euros for uh, his or her participation? Or is it um, um, not ethical? That is a wonderful question. And it's one that does come up quite a bit. It doesn't come up that much in, in my specific field. Um, in terms of religion and theology, but we do encounter it from time to time. So for example, there's a big organization that wants to go to a large community and they just want to ask them things like, for example, in this COVID situation, and they want to ask them, for example, uh, I don't know, is the hospital close to you? Just make it a really um, simple question. 
and they need the data. And then they would, for example, say, but oh, don't you just want to participate? We'll give you a meal or something like that, or we'll pay your um, transportation costs or something, for example. Now, generally that is considered quite par for the course and in general acceptable. Um, when it comes to medical research, there is a whole debate um, surrounding exactly the question that you've asked, uh, exactly how you pinpointed it. If, if it is still ethical, if someone is paid that much money, uh, for example, if someone is paid to participate in some other kidney or um, um, uh, uh, type of uh, trial, um, how far do you go in terms of that? Now, there are a lot of companies, for example, that would then say someone or you are allowed to pay someone their transportation costs and maybe do provide them for with meal or provide them with housing, especially if they have to travel far. But that exorbitant amount of money is definitely, um, I think, in terms of even the broadest understanding of participation, that big amount of money would be considered unethical. So there's always this fine balance in terms of balancing the risk and accountability. And I know that a lot of people participating in medical trials and companies do offer what we call incentives. But that incentive needs to be um, usually, in, in, at least in our legislation, but as I understand, it's this is a worldwide um, ethical concern. These things need to be, especially when it comes to medical trials, to be approved by health committees across the world. It's not only in our country. And there, when it comes to informed consent, one of the things that they will scrutinize before they provide consent for this type of trial to take place is what is the balance in terms of the risk and accountability ratio and what, um, how does it impact someone's, um, you know, free ability to participate if you award them that amount of money. So there's definitely a principle of in providing um, incentives, but it must not border on coercion. And that is where the ethical values and the, and the virtues and your framework starts to enter into the discussion. And that is something that is extremely scrutinized. That a huge amount of money, in my opinion, would be considered unethical. And I don't think any health ethics committee of any sort would approve a trial in, in that regard. So. Thank you so much. That's a very, very important question. Hesrin, you already unmuted yourself. Um, you can ask your question now. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I don't have a question, but uh, I just want to make a comment on uh, uh, an in, an somebody you are interviewing who refuses to to be to be recorded. Just I want to make a comment on what Emmanuel said. But um, uh, firstly, I want to say thank you, Dr. Tanya, for that good lecture. It was good. I, I've just been doing my research, and uh, I I I went to do an interview to, to go and I went to interview uh, some police men in a police station, and they refused me. They didn't want me to record them. They told me, come tomorrow. When I went the second day, they were so furious and I got discouraged. But I, I'm just very happy that I had a young man who had um, uh, somehow uh, ethical teachings like what Dr. Tanya has taught us this morning. He, to he told me, don't worry, when they refuse to be recorded, you just walk away. But for me, I felt like, uh, am I doing something wrong? Because I'm just doing a, a research and uh, this research, I'm not going to, to, to write their names. I'm just going to give what they have given. Maybe I could mention a police uh, somewhere in this, a police in, in a certain uh, given police station said this, but they refused me. I could not interview them. The next time I made an, uh, an appointment to go and interview a, a chief, a certain chief or a certain area, he told me, come this date. When I went, he was not there. He was just communicating with me on phone. And later on, I, dis I discovered that he had communicated with the policemen in the other police station who I had gone to interview them and they refused me. So I just want to say it is ethical 
not just to force people to record them. Although we have some, although I had some questions that were for key informant interview, interview. Uh, but later on, I got some other people that I interviewed. I just wanted to make that comment. Thanks, Catherine. It's very important that informed consent is not only there to protect the participants, it's there to protect the people that uh, conduct the research as well. Uh, it's there for everyone. Um, of course, that's why um, uh, Lily Porter mentioned her code of conduct in terms which relates to informed consent, which might be biased in that way, and that is why we need to take note of that. But your specific, your specific remark is um, what the informed consent should be protecting you as well, whoever participates. And the point is, is that if those people don't want to be recorded and they are weird or funny the next day, it probably means some form of coercion will be involved. And that is why some informed consent forms, depending on the approach and the research design and the topic that is studied, etc., will contain a very specific sentence that says no remuneration, no payment, no whatsoever can be expected from the participants, uh, from, from, the, from the researcher, so that um, they cannot um, in any way blackmail uh, the, the researchers to be able to get those funds to extract that information. The, the informed consent form that we use in the faculty, for example, has got the sentence. And if someone conducts a project um, that some sort of incentive, sentence like um, payment for uh, traveling or meals or stuff like that, then that person has to state that specifically. But from our faculty's um, uh, broad approach, for example, we explicitly state in that form that the participants may not expect money. So you didn't do anything wrong. And that was a situation that was going to go bad in any case. And it's an ethical in its very core. And it's better that you walked away in that regard. Um, so well done for you. Thank you for sharing that. I see there's one more um, hand. Um, can I just ask uh, Deirdre, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you for the insightful um, presentation. Just one comment and one question. I'll start with the, with the question. When you do research in a particular community, um, obviously you wouldn't know all aspects of the culture, um, you know, what is taboo, what is accepted and so forth. So you mentioned earlier on that more and more researchers include the different approaches of ethical approaches within the, within the um, uh, research. Um, do you then, um, you know, um, apply um, various approaches um, that you possibly could then have to take into consideration, not knowing at the time, um, you know, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, um, but still making sure that you have that in hand, even if you have to change, because obviously you're going to have to adapt uh, within that particular culture when you get there and start doing the research. That is my one question. And then just a comment with what you said earlier, not relating to this, you, you mentioned about lecturing and being recorded. Um, now, particularly, you know, with the online lecturing, but of course also with the particular with COVID, um, where one, you do have your e-learning platform to do your lectures on, and of course there are certain ethical policies within that, but which you obviously can't control because at some times you have to go to, to other, um, you know, alternatives of, of, of doing lectures for students not being able to attend and so forth, and you need to do the recordings and so forth. How do you control or manage that particularly? Because if one then have to look at that, they're going to have to be various policies um, that governs, um, you know, those kind of uh, lectures do, uh, that one do online and on various different e-learning platforms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deirdre. Uh, excellent questions. I'll start with your last one um, first. I must uh, admit, I am petrified of not teaching online, I don't mind. I've learned to do all of that, I love it. But I am not 100% sure that we have thought this whole thing through. And um, at our previous Senate Committee on Research Ethics, there's this whole discussion about already, how do you go about um, using information on social media platforms? Because this is also not clear cut. It's not everything that is publicly available. It can be utilized always, there are fine nuances. And a part of this, absolutely, you're 100% correct, would be to start talking about um, uh, recording lectures, the usage of it, the policies related in that. So at the moment, I teach live for a first year group. The other groups are narrow PowerPoints, but once again, it's extremely um, intimidating recording lectures, knowing that people can take those little clips, do whatever they want with them. 
and um, as course the same with the recordings. So in some of the cases which I have started to do, but I haven't worked this out enough, is basically built a disclaimer into the start of such lectures, saying that this information may only be used for the way that it was presented, for example. And um, but you're 100 percent correct. They will be have to we have to think more about this. I'm personally uh, I have to uh, do that uh, on the platform and I have to um, do the recordings now. Um, but there is ongoing discussions and debates about this, and we will really need to look at this a lot more clearly. So you're 100 percent correct. Just to get to um, the. Um, uh, first one in terms of uh, researchers adding this approach in the uh, uh, methodology section. Of course, one of the things I didn't mention in this specific course, which I did mention um, previously in some of the other courses, I think, um, was that it's sometimes very important, depending on your topic and the community, as you mentioned, to get an insider. Uh, much the way that you would get like a psychologist or someone to help you um, or a social worker design the questions. Many times it's necessary to get an insider in the community to help you design the research. But um, relating to your question in terms of how this might change as you learn more about the community, a lot of um, ethical processes these days have got like a follow on steps built into the re review to help the researcher. So you start with something, you always realize it's preliminary. And as the research changes and your, your approach changes, it allows you to adapt that. I know in our, for example, system, there is the possibility to do um, annual um, amendments, changes, remarks, to allow the researchers' research to be dynamic and not static, because research isn't static, it's dynamic. So um, that is very important. So in, in community insight is important, and your research will be able to change over time. I know a lot of um, systems do incorporate that. So thank you so much for that, Deirdre. Uh, very good questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Is there one last question? Okay, Xolile, you will get the last question of the session. Uh, thank you. It's not a question. Uh, it's just to uh, make a, a brief comment that, Doc, when I started this, uh, the, this research in terms of corruption and all of that, it was a preacher in me who was really annoyed. And, you know, I realized when I spoke with my uh, supervisors that, you know, this is not a platform to preach at people who are doing wrongdoing. And, and now again, you are reinforcing that it's not even to whistleblow, uh, but it is to add a body of knowledge to this in terms of uh, our, in this whole problem we're dealing with. And I take that to heart. And that's what I wanted to, to let you know that at least for the second time now, people are making sure that I'm on the right and narrow path. Uh, thank you very much for your input. Wonderful, Tulili. But you, what you must do one day, you must look at those whistleblowing policies if they exist, because that would be a fascinating study in analyzing them in terms of different approaches, uh, ethical approaches, and maybe also different uh, epistemologies to have a look at that. So um, keep that in mind, because I would love to, to read stuff like that. So thank you so much for your remark, and thank you for everyone that participated.